severe weather across the middle of the country, including a deadly outbreak of tornadoes. At least three people died when a twister touched down in western Ohio. That's just north of Dayton. Multiple storms caused devastation in Indiana as well. At least seven tornadoes were detected across the two states, part of a massive system. Clay Gordon from our Columbus affiliate, WBNS, joins us from Indian Lake, Ohio. Clay, good morning. So what are you seeing? Nate, where I'm standing, we're seeing extensive damage to homes and property. Local police here are working to confirm if there's any more injuries or even deaths related to this violent weather. We're also seeing severe weather across other parts of the Midwest as well. In Auglaize County, this witness caught the moment a tornado formed. There's some of our boxes. In neighboring Logan County, a reported tornado ripped through a trailer park. First responders at the scene say the damage was extensive and are calling it a mass casualty event. They reported at one point a shortage of ambulances. Tornado on the ground right over the Ohio River. A view from above shows extensive destruction to numerous homes, roofs torn off, buildings torn to shreds, and piles of debris strewn across neighborhoods. We just ran to the middle of the house into the utility room, and about 30 seconds later, the bit hit, and you see the damage. A different violent tornado slammed Randolph and Delaware counties in eastern Indiana. Emergency officials are there this morning trying to confirm the extent of injuries and possible deaths. That work will begin in the morning uh, to actually go through and, and, and subdivide every single one of those properties and do everything within our power to find out if there is anyone still within the confines of those collapsed buildings. The same storm system dumped buckets of large hail from Texas to the Midwest. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it's, uh, it's full of dings. Now the National Weather Service will be coming here to just see how strong the wind was that ravaged some of these areas, including here in Ohio. Gail? Yeah. Clay Gordon, thank you very much. We're also tracking a massive winter storm this morning in Colorado that has dumped several feet of snow there. Parts of a major interstate had to be partially shut down for safety reasons. And at one point, around 75,000 people in this area had no power. That's not good, David. Dave Malkoff is in Golden, Colorado, that's west of Denver, with the latest. Dave, I have to say it looks a little better today than it did yesterday. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, welcome to the warmth. It's not as blustery as it was, Gail. Doesn't this tell the story? There are cars like this all over this exit, just frozen in place. Hundreds of people from all over the country came here thinking they were having a ski vacation in Colorado and ended up going nowhere. A wall of wet, heavy snow descended on the most populated parts of Colorado Thursday causing chaos on the roadways. Driving around in these poor conditions is not the thing to do. Near Colorado Springs, where drivers were spinning their tires and trying to get out of the snow. Some parts of the state have got 20, 30 inches of snow. Now, try digging out of all this. The Denver area got roughly 18 inches. When I actually came out and put the stick in the snow, it was 18 and a half. It's pushing 19 and snowing again. I-70, which connects Denver to some of the state's biggest ski resorts, had to be partially closed on Wednesday. I came here to ski. 11-year-old William Pena traveled here with his parents from San Antonio, Texas. Our flight got canceled. We rented a car, came up here, tried to get to Steamboat, uh, but unfortunately the blizzard set us in and we were lucky enough to get a place to stay here. It was a similar story for thousands of travelers at Denver International Airport. I was crying all day yesterday because I wanted to be home, and I can't. Snowfall in the Colorado Rockies melts down, and that delivers water to 40 million people across five states and Native American nations and even into Mexico. So maybe this could put a dent in the mega drought, but you know what? It would take at least a decade of heavy snowfall to do that, Tony. Dave, thank you very much. We are expecting more dangerous weather today in the south. Luckily, we've got Stephanie Abrams with our partners at the Weather Channel to track it all for us as she does so well. Steph, good morning.
Tony, good morning. The severe weather threat has shifted to the south for the day today. A couple tornadoes are possible, but large hail will be the primary risk. You also have to watch out for flooding in low-lying areas and where there's poor drainage. There will be clouds and showers up the east coast, but the most intense storms will fire up into Texas and into the southeast. There will be several more rounds of rain that will come through for our Saturday and Sunday. In all, we'll get another two to three inches of rain. The weekend starts off warm. Then on St. Patrick's Day, we see the invasion of cool air. Monday's highs will be 10 to 15 degrees below average from the Great Lakes to the Gulf Coast. For more in-depth coverage, you can watch the Weather Channel on cable or live on your favorite TV streaming devices. Tony, the lows are going to be cold too, but there's hope. Spring is going to spring into action next week. I love when spring does that. Stephanie Abrams, thank you very much. In Michigan, a jury has convicted the father of school shooter Ethan Crumbly of involuntary manslaughter. This is part two of a first-of-its-kind case where the gunman's parents were charged with a crime. Crumbly's mother was convicted last month. Elaine Keanu has covered these landmark trials and has more on the verdict. Guilty of involuntary manslaughter. James Crumbly shook his head as he heard the word guilty in a Michigan courtroom Thursday evening. Prosecutors addressed reporters after the verdict. This verdict does not bring back their children, but it does mark a moment of accountability. Crumbly was found guilty on four counts of involuntary manslaughter in the 2021 shooting deaths of Michigan high school students Madison Baldwin, Tate Meir, Hannah St. Juliana, and Justin Schilling. We gotta see what, what we can do to support these kids better. Buck Meir is Tate's father. We need to solve this because no parent should go through the hell we're going through. Your Honor, calling people versus Ethan Crumbly. Crumbly's son shot and killed the four students at Oxford High School using a gun his father had purchased four days before. The shooter is currently serving a life sentence. The prosecution said James Crumbly was grossly negligent in storing the gun and failed to help his son, who was struggling from mental health issues. In separate trials, Crumbly and his wife Jennifer faced involuntary manslaughter charges for the shooting. It's the first time parents have been convicted of criminal charges of this kind. We're facing these school shootings, and I think there's a feeling that we don't know who to appropriately blame, but it's more than just the shooter. CBS News legal contributor Jessica Levinson says it may not be the last. One case does not set a precedent. Two cases potentially does. Unfortunately, we know there will be a next time. There will be another school shooting, and that school shooter will have parents. And the question is, will there be enough red flags in that next case to charge the parents with criminal liability? In a statement, the defense maintained James Crumbly did not know that his son could or would harm anyone, adding, quote, James feels terrible about what happened, end quote. Crumbly and his wife are expected to be sentenced next month. They could each spend up to 15 years in prison. Nate. Elaine, thank you. In our next half hour, we'll talk with the prosecutor who put the Crumblies on trial and ask if she thinks this sets a precedent for future cases. And now the latest in former President Donald Trump's effort to avoid a criminal trial in Florida. A judge rejected one of Trump's motions yesterday to dismiss charges that he mishandled classified documents. The presumptive Republican nominee attended the hearing where his lawyers argued the case was unconstitutionally vague. The judge still has to decide if Donald Trump had the authority to designate classified documents as his own personal records. And in the Democratic campaign, Vice President Kamala Harris visited an abortion clinic in Minnesota yesterday, something no vice president or president has ever done while in office. As Weijia Zhang reports, the Biden-Harris campaign is using the potential threat of losing abortion access to drive voters to the polls come November. We are facing a very serious health crisis. Vice President Kamala Harris visited the Planned Parenthood Clinic in St. Paul, Minnesota Thursday, the sixth date on her tour focusing on fighting for reproductive freedoms. Extremists have proposed and passed laws that have denied women access to reproductive health care. Since neighboring states like North Dakota and South Dakota, along with several others, enacted full abortion bans, the clinic has seen a 25 percent surge in abortion cases and a 100 percent increase in patients from out of state. It is dangerous and it is putting my patients and health care providers at severe risk. 
starting with its first joint rally back in January. Extremists are trying to pass a national abortion ban. The Biden-Harris campaign has put reproductive rights front and center of the presidential election. 57% of Americans and 62% of women say the overturning of Roe v. Wade nearly two years ago was mostly bad for the country. Donald Trump has touted his role in the reversal, establishing the Supreme Court responsible. But if it weren't for me with Roe v. Wade, you wouldn't even be talking about this. But says he's undecided on a 15-week national abortion ban that some Republicans support. You have to win elections. Otherwise, you're going to be back where you were. President Biden was busy on the campaign trail, too, with a stop in Michigan yesterday. It was his first visit to that battleground state since its Democratic primary last month, when more than 100,000 voters cast ballots for uncommitted instead of Biden to protest his policies surrounding the Israel-Hamas war. Gail? Weisha, thank you very much. A longtime staunch supporter of Israel is now criticizing its leadership's approach to the war with Hamas. In a wide-ranging speech yesterday, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer denounced Hamas for its attacks on October 7th, but he also had a stark warning about the conduct of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and called on Israel to hold a new election. Chris Livesay is in East Jerusalem with Israel's response. Chris, the senator did not hold back yesterday. Good morning to you. Good morning, Gail. Yeah, the reaction from Netanyahu's party has been fierce, demanding Chuck Schumer, quote, refrain from undermining the Israeli government. The Senate Majority Leader also went after Hamas for starting the war on October 7 with that ruthless massacre. Chuck Schumer, emphasizing he's the highest ranking Jewish elected official in the United States, levied a blistering attack on everyone he holds responsible for the war in Gaza. To blame only Israel for the deaths of Palestinians is unfair, one-sided, and often deliberately manipulative. And it ignores Hamas's role in this conflict. The Senate Majority Leader blaming the terror group, as well as Israel's far right, as some of the biggest obstacles for a U.S.-backed two-state solution and taking aim at Palestinian leaders. Quite frankly, I haven't heard enough Palestinian leaders express anguish about Hamas and other extreme elements of Palestinian society. I implore them to speak up now, even when it may be hardest. That includes Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas clinging to office for nearly 20 years. Polling shows 90% of Palestinians want the 88-year-old to step down. But Schumer's most eye-raising comments were to Israel's prime minister. Prime Minister Netanyahu has lost his way. He has been too willing to tolerate the civilian toll in Gaza, which is pushing support for Israel worldwide to historic lows. Israel cannot survive if it becomes a pariah. Yes, lechatzim. The embattled prime minister is vowing to push away international pressures and carry on the offensive in Gaza, where airstrikes continued overnight during the first week of Ramadan. Netanyahu is wildly unpopular here in Israel. Remember, the, the October 7 attack happened on his watch, not to mention the kidnappings. And now Hamas is saying it's considering the release of those hostages in exchange for a ceasefire and up to 1,000 Palestinian prisoners. But so far, Israel says that is unrealistic. Tony? Yeah, it is pretty lopsided. Chris, let's say for us in East Jerusalem. Chris, uh, thank you very much. I want to linger for a second, uh, guys, on the, the Schumer speech because mm -hmm. it's a lot more than just a headline about Netanyahu. He says a lot of the things that I can tell you American Jews are saying amongst themselves in text messages all day long. There's a full defense of Israel as a Jewish nation with Jewish history. There's a heaping of blame on Hamas for hiding behind civilians. Mm -hmm. and another key part, Netanyahu may be unpopular, but there's an endorsement here from Schumer of the war effort to eradicate Hamas, or at least eliminate them from any position of power, saying there can be no peace unless that happens. Mm -hmm. So people should really listen to the whole thing. If you want a window into yeah. what American Jews are saying and thinking, a lot of it's in that speech. He lays it out yeah. very nicely. Please listen. As rumors continue to swirl around the status of Princess Kate, her husband, William, appeared at an event in London last night honoring his mother, Princess Diana. So did his brother, Harry, but not in the same room and not at the same time. Ramey Innocencio is following all of the royal drama. Ramey, good morning. 
Nate, good morning. The royal rift between Prince William and Prince Harry was just so evident in the optics of that awards gala honoring their mother's legacy last night. The brothers kept their distance both in timing and in place half a world away. And this evening's legacy award is particularly Not even special. an event honoring Princess the Diana's mom. legacy could bring her estranged sons together. She taught me that everyone has the potential to give something back. William celebrated 20 young social change makers appearing at the London Gala in person. Harry congratulated them via video from his home in California, only after his brother departed. The last time they were seen together in public was in 2022, just after their grandmother, Queen Elizabeth, died. The rift is ongoing. Royals watcher Roy Anika was at last night's ceremony. It's a great shame that William and Harry can't unite um, actually in person for something like that, but everyone's very realistic about it now. It's been going on for a while. No one really has any expectations it's going to be any different anytime soon. The Royals are under uncomfortable scrutiny this week. Earlier in the day, while opening a youth charity, William spoke about his wife, Kate Middleton. My wife is the artist. Those words and their timing raised eyebrows, coming just after Kate admitted to digitally editing this family photo that William took. Several global news agencies issued a rare kill order to withdraw it. Agence France Press says Kensington Palace is no longer a trusted source of news. We are so used to having a very kind of steady, dutiful royal family, even with the family rifts that have been going on for the last few years, that when things like you know absences happen, what suddenly rushes to fill the void is all sorts of strange speculation, but it's, it's, not been, it's not been a great week for them. And the last time Kate Middleton was seen in public was on Christmas Day. Her abdominal surgery was mid-January. That is when Kensington Palace said that she would not return to public duties until likely after Easter. Tony, for the Royals, that day can't get here any faster. For the world as well, Ramey, thank you very much. It has been a long time. That's why people are so interested. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it seems when they tried to show us that she was okay, the picture backfired massively. Yeah, big time, big time, big time, big time. They said no health updates, but that was a health I'm update, so not the one they intended. The I'm sorry the rift continues, though. I am, too.